So it seems like uh, lineage, uh, dynasties are particularly prevalent among artists, showbiz people, and in religious families. Our next speaker is Anne Graham Lotz. Anne, it's nice to meet you. This is the second of uh, Billy Graham's five children. And uh, well, I'll let her tell you her own story. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I appreciate very much, Moses, the uh, attention that you're giving women at Idea City. I'm a woman who's broken quite a few glass ceilings, and I just appreciate very much uh, what I feel is your applause of women in places of influence. And it's very interesting for me to be here and in trying to think of what I would say, I'm just going to tell you my story. And I hope that it relates to some of you. And I was thinking this morning, and actually, it's just about this time, three years ago, at this moment, on this day, that my beloved mother was buried. And, uh, and I was so thankful at that moment that I had a foundation that I had established and on which I had built my life that was stable and secure and would carry me through something like that, the death of a, someone who was perhaps more precious to me than anyone else other than, uh, or at least outside my family. And, um, and so I was thinking several years ago, we remodeled our house. And when we did, I had the contractor come in and he went underneath the house and he came out and he said, Mrs. Lott, you have to rebuild your foundation before you can build on top of it because the foundation is so weak that it's not stable and it's not secure. So I had to rebuild the foundation of the house and, and I think that probably is an illustration of what sometimes we need to do in our lives because we're busy building our lives and not realizing perhaps that the foundation on which we're building is weak that when the storms of life come, death, disease, divorce, problems, pressures, pain, our foundation won't hold up. And so when I was, uh, I was born um, and raised, of course, in a home where Jesus Christ was uh, believed in, he was obeyed, he was served, and he was loved. So grateful that my parents' faith was authentic, not just something you saw in public, but what you saw in private behind closed doors. And so early on, when I was a young girl, uh, and I was watching a film about the life of Jesus on television, and when it came to the scene of the cross, when Jesus was crucified, I became very convinced that he died for my sin, and that my sin had separated me from God, and I told God that I was sorry, and I asked him to forgive me. It wasn't amnesty that he offered me, it was absolute absolution of guilt, atonement for sin, forgiveness, and I asked him if he would apply the death of Jesus to my sin so that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross would apply to me. I asked him to forgive me and come into my life, and I believe that he did, and right there, I laid the foundation for my life. The foundation of my life is laid in Jesus Christ, who I believe is the living word of God, and my Bible, which I believe is the written word of God. And so I established that foundation, which was a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus. And I learned about him and grew to know him as I read my Bible. When I was a teenager, and I don't know what triggered this, but it occurred to me one day that when I stood before God, I had thought up until that time, when I stood before God, I would just tell him who my daddy is and who my mother was, and somehow I would get credit for being associated with them. <laughs> and it occurred to me when I stand before God, I will give an account to him for my life who I am, what I've done or haven't done. And, uh, and so I, I decided when I was a teenager, before God, and I told him this in prayer, that I wanted to live a life of significance. I wanted to live a life that counted. I wanted to live a life that would benefit and impact the people of my generation. And so I just offered my life for service, just made myself available to him. Uh, it was several years later, at the age of 26, I found myself married with three children, five, three, and 10 months old, and because of just the business of young motherhood, I had neglected God, and I had established a relationship with him. I was trying to pursue that, but just in the business of life, there was no time to be disciplined in talking to him in prayer, hearing what he had to say through reading my Bible, and so I had neglected that. And I, was, and I would describe it as being homesick for God. And so one thing led to another. I began a Bible class in my city that I taught just because I wanted to be in it. Nobody else would teach it, so I taught it so I could be in it. 500 ladies showed up to be in the class also. And I started at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, the first book. And it wasn't too long before I came to the biography of Abraham. 
And Abraham, of course, is one of the greatest people that's ever lived in human history. Some people think he's perhaps the greatest other than Jesus Christ. He's considered um, the founder or the father of three world religions today, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And yet, when I began his biography, I thought, you know, he's rather a very ordinary man. And he lived in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is in the modern day Iraq, Iran. And, um, and he was raised in a home of idolatry where they had many religions and many gods. And, um, and he just seemed rather ordinary. Um, and except that I think there must have been, the Bible doesn't tell us, but something of a stirring in his spirit. And maybe he saw the migratory habits of the birds, or maybe he saw the birth of a human baby, or the sun come up every morning and go down every evening. And I think within him there was something, there's got to be someone out there greater than what I know. Um, and I would assume it was a stirring in his spirit because the Bible says God leaned out of heaven and just spoke into his life and said, Abraham, if you'll follow me in a life of obedient faith, then I'm going to bless you. I'll use you to be a blessing. I'll give you descendants like the stars of the sky. I'll give you this land. And in the end, you'll have a descendant that will be, in essence, the Messiah, the one who would bring people back into a right relationship, a reconciled relationship with their creator. And Abraham left everything behind and he followed God one step at a time, one day at a time, choice by choice by choice for all of his life in a life of obedient faith. He made many mistakes. He failed, he lied, he committed adultery, so he wasn't perfect, but he never quit. He just pursued a relationship with God. And at the end of his life, when I finished that biography, I was reading it and I thought, you know, Abraham, at the end of your life, God promised you this land, but you had to buy a cave in which to bury your wife. You don't have any land. And he promised you descendants like the stars of the sky, and basically you just have one son. And Abraham, have you just made a fool of yourself? Have you just wasted your life? You have all these unfulfilled promises of God. And then it occurred to me what Abraham had at the end of his life was a relationship with God that God three times in the Bible said was a friendship. And you know, if I told you the Queen of England was my friend, you could laugh, but if she walked in here and said, Ann Lotz is my friend, that's impressive. And Abraham didn't say God is my friend, God said Abraham is my friend. So 34 years ago, when I finished the biography of Abraham, I decided that's what I wanted. My life's goal is to know God better today than I did yesterday, better tomorrow than I do today. I'm obsessed not with politics or ethics, although I find them very interesting. I'm obsessed with knowing God. And I believe God has invited me to know him not in religion, a denomination, an organization, an institution. He has invited me to know him in a personal, permanent love relationship. You talk about being amazed and you talk about being wondering at something so magnificent. And so I started 34 years ago, just on that, I had established my foundation when I came to the cross of Jesus Christ and confessed my sin, asked him to forgive me. I believe God accepted that and brought me into his family. But it was when I did the biography of Abraham, it's like he walked off the pages of my Bible into my life and I thought that's what I wanted. And so I began to pursue God, just reading my Bible every day, spending time talking to him in prayer, doing what he said, which I believe at that point was raising my children and teaching that Bible class. I did that for 12 years. I never missed a week's class because I wanted everything God had for me. Finally, I left the class, turned it over to somebody else. There are now 10 classes of equal size. We have thousands of people in my city in the scripture reading the Bible pursuing a relationship with God because of that. But I went out into the world. I got invitations from all over the world to tell people what God had to say through his word. You don't have to receive what he says. You don't have to believe it. I'm just there to tell you what the Bible says in a way that would help you relate what he says to your life. And then after 12 years of traveling the world because of situations in my life, I felt desperate. I wanted a fresh encounter with Jesus. I wanted a fresh touch from heaven. and. I didn't want to quit what I was doing or take drugs or alcohol in a way to escape. I didn't want a vacation, didn't even want a miracle. I just wanted a fresh encounter with Jesus. And my heart's cry was just give me Jesus. And I, I went back to the Gospel of John in the Bible, studied the biography of Jesus there. I believe God gave it to me, but then he opened my eyes and said, if Ann Graham Lotz could have a desperate heart's cry for a fresh encounter with Jesus Christ, and maybe other people do too. And so 10 years ago, I began what we call just Give Me Jesus Arena Events for Women. We were at the Air Canada Center not too long ago, packed it out with women who are coming for a fresh encounter with Jesus Christ. And, and I believe many thousands of those women found Jesus in a fresh way. And so I've just been on a pursuit to know God. 
I want to know him in fullness. I don't want him just tacked onto my life. You know, like on Sunday, I go to church or when I'm with a, a group, I just, you know, behave one way. I want him to saturate my life. I want him to fill my life. And so I want to grow in that relationship with him until one day my faith becomes sight. And I want to tell you something. As I have grown, I don't know him as well as I want to, as one day I hope to know him, but I know him better than I did when I started 34 years ago. And my relationship with God gives me a deep peace in my heart. So when the world's unraveling and volcanoes are erupting and earthquakes are shattering things and diseases and wars and terrorist threats, there's a deep peace in my heart like a river that goes through everything because I know God is in control. I have joy in my life that's not dependent on circumstances and right now my husband is quite a bit older than I am. Diabetes is blown up in his face. He's gone blind in one eye. He's on kidney dialysis. He has three shunts in his heart. And I'm watching this world-class athlete. He had won the national championship in basketball when he was in college and watching him just deteriorate physically. Very difficult to see someone you love going through hardships like that. My son, when he was 28, was diagnosed with life-threatening cancer, went through surgery, follow-up radiation. That wasn't as bad as his divorce four years ago. And we saw his life's dreams shattered. And, and other things that I've been through, different difficult things, but, but underneath, there's not only the peace that I know God is in control, but there's a joy that's not resting in my circumstances or in my family, but just in my relationship with God. And I can have that joy regardless of the world that's collapsing around me, and I also have hope. And I know, it's not a hope so, it's a confidence that one day, God is going to set everything right, that all of this is taking place in my life, and I believe in the world for a divine purpose, that God has a purpose in mind, because I believe that there is a one true living God, and I believe he's the creator of the heavens and earth and everything within them. I believe that Jesus Christ is his only son. That does not mean Jesus is God Jr. It means that he is God, fully God. He is fully God and fully man, God in the flesh. I believe Jesus was born of a virgin. God was his physical father. I believe that he died on the cross to make atonement for my sin. I believe that when I put my faith in Jesus, I'm absolved of my guilt, I'm forgiven of any of my sin, all of my sin, past, present, future. I'm reconciled with God, made right with him. Heaven is my birthright. I have a right to heaven because I am now the Father's child. I believe Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. On the third day, he rose up from the dead. I believe he ascended into heaven where he is even now in his man's physical body, praying for me and getting ready. He's preparing heaven for me and one day he will come back to this earth to reign and rule. And so I know that in the end of God's story, which we call history, in the end of human history, good will win out over hate and love will win out over hate and hope will win out over despair and peace will win out over war and God's going to make it all right because I believe the end of God's story, the end of human history is Jesus Christ. So the chief cornerstone of my life is Jesus and if I can just give you one verse of scripture and then I'm going to I'll leave you just finally with this one verse of scripture that I call the North Star of the Bible. If you align your life with this, you can find your way home. And it's this, that God so loved the world. That means you and that means me, that means everybody. So inclusive, God loves the whole world that he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross as that sacrifice for your sin. And whosoever believes in him, that means anybody, everybody, whoever you might be, whoever would believe in him and put their faith in Jesus would not perish in a life of emptiness and meaninglessness and end up when you step into eternity being separated forever from him, but you would have eternal life. And eternal life is not just going to heaven when you die. Eternal life is having a personal, permanent love relationship with God right here and right now. So the goal of my life is to know God in a relationship that one day he would acknowledge as a friendship. And so I look forward when my faith becomes sight and I step into eternity, I want to see that glad recognition on his face. And I want to hear his welcome. And I'm so glad you've come home, you're my friend. So that's my story. And I don't know what yours is, but I know my story has many parts and pieces to it that would relate to anyone here. And I do know that God loves you and that he offers you not just amnesty, reconciliation, forgiveness through the person of Jesus Christ. So Moses, thank you very much for the opportunity to share 
my story with you today, and I'm going to be around today. I would love to entertain questions or get into dialogue with you, but thank you. Thank you, thank you Anne. Okay. 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 Thank you. And I did want to ask you a question, and, and I, not to be argumentative, but I was shocked to find out that the Southern Baptist Convention, right? I've got the name right? I've, yes? I don't know what I, you're going to say. So. Well, that they, they've issued a kind of ruling that prevents you from being the pastor of a church uh, because yeah. you're a woman? Well, the Southern Baptists, you know, that's one thing, Moses, that I'm trying to uh, emphasize in what I just shared, that I'm... I don't believe that God has called me to a church, a denomination, or organization. He's called me to himself. And so what the Southern Baptists say is just a never mind to me because I'm on a journey to pursue God. I want to be what he wants me to be. I want to follow him. I want to fulfill his purpose for my life. I believe God has a purpose for Ann Graham Lotz, and I want to fulfill that purpose. And no Southern Baptist convention can thwart that purpose. So. Right on. <laughs> okay. <Thank you. laughs>